please um, be joined by JHK of the All Star to talk a little MMA. Conor McGregor, you know better than anybody, is such a, a big story. And now with this news that he's going to be cleared to return to sparring in April, I'm curious to your feedback to that and also who you think uh, his best next fight is. Even if he returns to sparring in April, I don't think we'll see him next year. I don't think we see him fight in 2022. This is an injury. It's a serious injury. It takes a long time to return. I think psychologically it's going to take a toll on him as he returns, as he goes into training. I'm pretty sure he's probably going to get injured again during training. It's not going to be easy for him. But if he does return next year, maybe I'm wrong. I think it all depends on who's the champion at 155. If Dustin Poirier is the champion, if he's the sitting champion, if he wants to return and defend that belt, I think Conor McGregor gets an immediate rematch. I think he gets an immediate title shot. A lot of people are not going to like that, but this is the fight game. This is prize fighting, and they fight for prizes. You know what I mean? And the UFC, they love money, so they're going to put money fights together. I do want to talk to you about Poirier a little bit, um, but just to stick with McGregor for a moment, you know, you you obviously noted the severity of this injury. One of the things that he noted on Twitter is that, you know, he had this titanium rod put into his leg. Um, he said that, you know, he can't wait to use that as a weapon against his next opponent. I know that there's a lot of talk like that in, in MMA, in uh, UFC. What was your reaction to, you know, to him saying that he wanted to use this very serious injury um, as a weapon in the future? I think, like you said, it's it's all talk. You know, it sounds good. It sounds violent. And we're in a violent sport fighting. It creates headlines. You know, he wants to stay in the news any way he can. And he's, you know, everybody's watching him. Everything he tweets out, everything on social media, they're dissecting it. And uh, the McGregor faithful, they eat it up. So he's going to say that. And uh, it sounds crazy. But I don't know. It, if you look at it, the only other fighter that I remember that had a titanium rod in his leg when he returned was Anderson Silva. He, and it's exactly the same thing. He broke his leg, you know, in a fight against Chris Weidman. Um, when, he, when he was returning, the commission, they allowed him to return in Nevada. The reason why is because they, the doctors that, you know, consult with the commission, they said that there is no scientific proof that he's going to have an unfair advantage with a titanium rod in his leg. So... I think it's going to, I think it might hurt him more kicking somebody than, you know, him hurting someone else with a titanium rod. What should we expect from Conor McGregor, whether he returns this year or next year? Uh, is he sort of past the point of, of being a threat or, you know, he surprised people in the past and, and he might actually be able to put this serious injury behind him? That's the question. Is he even going to return? We don't even know, you know, he say he's going to return and, you know, he's, he's talking a lot, but this is a serious injury and he's not 24. He's almost 34. Well, I think he'll be 34 next year in, in the summer. Um, that's not a young age for a fighter, right? That has been through a, a traumatic injury, has been through some, some serious fights and, uh, and hard training. You know what I mean? A lot of training camps. He's put his body through a lot. And uh, when you're sitting on like, hundreds of millions of dollars. People always talk about this, right? If you're sitting on so much money, why do you even want to come back, right? Are you even hungry like the other fighters? The other fighters, they don't have that much money. They don't live in mansions. They're not, you know, riding around in yachts. You know, they're not doing all that. They're, they're training. They're going to the gym every day. You know, they're hungry. So it's, it's hard to say, but if he does return, I don't think we're going to see anything different. I think we're going to see a shell of himself, just like we saw Anderson Silva when he came back. He was a shell of himself. He, he was, you know, very hesitant in everything he was doing inside that cage, and it, and it resulted in a, a terrible fight. So I see the same for uh, Conor McGregor if he does come back. And does Conor McGregor talking such a big game on social media to you? Is that an indication that he might be further from a return than, than people think? I mean, he does have a big, boisterous personality. Like you said, he's made a lot of money off of, off of that. Um, but but are these bold claims wanting to use the titanium rod and, you know, saying that he's going to have to pick of whoever he wants to fight when he comes back, is that an indication to you that um, at this point he might be further than people think? I don't know. I, I think that he is good at playing the the media. You know, the MMA media is, is they're, they're hanging on 
headlines, right? So Conor McGregor, he's just allowing himself to stay in the news until, you know, there's something to be released. It seems like, I think he's, he noted that he had some kind of like documentary coming out pretty soon about that fight, about the, the, the fight with Dustin Poirier, um, the lead up to it and, and the injuries that he sustained and why the leg was uh, vulnerable. And, and maybe he's going to show like what exactly happened with the broken leg and the, the recovery and, the, and, and everything. And I think that's why he's kind of staying in the news because once he releases that, that keeps everybody, you know, anticipating something. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if, you know, that we could indicate like his actions on social media as something of what he's going to do in, in let's say a year, because it's going to take a while for him to come back. All right. Let's transition now to Dustin Poirier. Um, how do you see his fight on December 11th going and what is the, the relevance uh, of a win there in terms of uh, the arch of his career in UFC? The, the win, if he goes in there and, and defeats Charles Oliveira, I feel like that is the biggest win of his career because then he will be the undisputed lightweight champion. You know, there's, I think there's a difference between interim lightweight champion and undisputed. Undisputed means that you are on top of the mountain. You are the king of the division. And, and everybody knows the lightweight division is probably the toughest division in all of uh, the UFC. So uh, I think it's going to be the biggest win of his career, and it will open so many doors for him, so many fights, so many options. And, and I think that's what Dustin Poirier wants at this point in his career is to make as much money as possible and leave a, a great legacy. He's definitely the favorite going in, but what is he going to have to do specifically in order to have success against Oliveira? How do those two stack up against each other? Poirier, to have success against Oliveira, Oliveira has changed throughout the years you know he used to be this fighter that everybody thought if you just tapped him on his chin then he would go down and he would get knocked out in his last fight in his last couple of fights he proved that that's not the case but i believe dustin Poirier has the the skill set he has the striking he has the wrestling he's just the all-around mixed martial artist charles Oliveira also the same but i feel dustin Poirier at this point in his career is just much better and it's just a little bit a little bit uh, another level, you know, a lot of people like to say another level compared to Charles Oliveira. And uh, even though Charles Oliveira, he's always the underdog and he always comes through and beats the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the guy that has the advantages. I just think Justin Poirier, he's just riding high off those wins against McGregor and he'll go in there and capture that title. Yeah, both of those two uh, seem to be coming in with a pretty formidable winning streak. Or each mm -hmm. seems to have momentum. And like you said, if Oliveira can pull off this sort of underdog win that he's been known to do in the past, that that could be pretty compelling. I'm I'm just curious. I know on the All Star, I've seen you interview a number of fighters across um, a number of different weight categories and divisions. I mean, which other fighters are you interested in that are either getting attention or maybe not getting the attention that they deserve outside of you know, this particular spotlight that, that Poirier and McGregor and Oliver are under? When you look at it, I think Alex Volkanovsky. You know, Alex Volkanovsky is a guy that I feel like people are, do not appreciate the level of intelligence that he shows us inside that cage. You know, I mean, he entered the UFC as this guy that takes people down and ground and pounds them. Now he's striking with the best strikers in the world and beating them with superior game plans. I don't know why people don't really realize that, you know, outside of, you know, that, 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 you know, that circle, like you said, like the, the McGregor circle and stuff. I think, you know, when you look at the pound for pound profound list, uh, Volkanovsky's up there. I believe he's like in the top three and, and deserving. So um, it's just that people don't realize it yet. I feel like the, the media and everybody else that watches the sport closely know that, but Volkanovsky, I think that in the next couple of years, he will prove that, you know, he should be in that conversation. It's, it's so interesting to, to speak with you kind of about the, the sport from a 30,000 foot view, because, you know, I admittedly am somebody that doesn't know a ton about it, but I'm fascinated by it. And also the, the mental and physical breakdowns, you know, where, where the advantages are, like you just mentioned mentally for, for these athletes who, you know, who do this and really quite literally put their lives on the line. I mean, why do you think that, that this style of fighting MMA uh, tracks with so much popularity globally it's just raw like you just go in there there's no one there to help you it's just you against another man or woman 
and you're going to fight until someone submits, someone gets knocked out. It's very easy to understand too. You know, it's like, I don't want to compare it to street fighting, but it's like street fighting. You know, if someone's out there, it's like a schoolyard fight. Let's say, let's say, you know, you go to the back of the school and two, two individuals, they fight each other. And, and one, if one wins, you break it up and then you move along. But this is in a professional arena, you know what I mean? At the highest level, skilled killers. These are skilled killers, you know what I mean? You have to respect it. I think that's what another level of it too is that we are not able to do what they do. And that's why I'm attracted to it because I'm not able to go out there and train for eight weeks and lose the weight, you know, to make the weight and then go in there to the, you know, at a hundred percent or as close to hundred percent and and then defeat another person while you're trying to, you know, solve the problem that they pose for you. And then they're trying to, you know, take you out at the same time. So I think that is something that's so raw and people understand it and it's not many rules to it and makes it simple. What percentage would you say is physical and what percentage is mental? That is a, that is such a hard question. You know, you have to ask the fighters, but some of the fighters and, and most of the fighters that I talk to, they say it's 80% mental and 20% physical. You know, if you don't have the mental side locked in and, and, and just loaded, then the 20% is not going to come through for you. And uh, that's what they say to me. I don't know. I have no idea. I've never fought. <laughs> um, what can fans of MMA expect from the All-Star and from what you guys are doing? I saw some really compelling fighter interviews that you guys are doing. Yeah, we, we're, you know, focusing on the fighters. We're focusing on the on the on the fights and and you know and learning about the fighters ahead of the fights what they're doing new what they've been doing what's working what's not working uh kind of getting like that inside scoop you know of what's what's inside the fighter's mind and what's inside the coach's mind i i interview a lot of coaches and ask them about certain fights and have them break it down through their lens how they see it what's the path to their you know to the victory for a certain fighter and I'm interested in all of that. It's, that's what I'm, that's why I like to cover. Uh, we're not really like a, a headline, you know, type of uh, outlet. We're, we're focused more on like looking deeper, deeper inside the fights. I'm, I read somewhere, I think that Dustin Poirier wants to switch weight classes, depending on what happens on December 11th, maybe go to welterweight. Is this a good idea for him? Or what's the point of that? I don't know. It's 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 an odd situation there because if he wins, he's I believe he said that he's going to welterweight. But then if you win, wouldn't you just want to stay and defend the title since you're the champion? But maybe he's thinking about going up there and, and fighting to become double champion. Maybe that's why he's throwing that out there. But there's a lot of very good fights for him at welterweight, uh, particularly Colby Covington. Kobe Covington has been calling out Dustin Poirier for the last couple of years. They've been going back and forth and they're talking about fighting each other. Why not? We know Kobe Covington is not going to go down to 155. He's going to stay at 170. Kobe Covington is a big name. It's a big fight. It will draw a lot of attention. And um, why not? Why not go up to welterweight? You know what I mean? Like, I think Dustin Poirier has deserved it with all the fights that he's put on. His resume is second to none. You know, he's fought everybody and he's beaten the best of the best hall of famers former champions everybody he just beat mcgregor twice in a row right so he deserves whatever he wants if he wants to go to welterweight he can go to welterweight but it kind of leaves the lightweight division in limbo <laughs> all right uh thank you so much jhk for being with us we really appreciate your insights on conor mcgregor which i know resonates with a lot of people here stateside but really on some of the deeper uh aspects of the sport it's really kind of fascinating especially for an outsider we appreciate it Thank you so much for having me.